Hi, this is Mrs. O'Reilly, and I'm here to discuss gases in the atmosphere from Unit 4A. So to start, our focus is going to be on the major components of the troposphere and atmosphere and discuss how the atmosphere changes with altitude, the properties of the atmosphere change with altitude. We're going to look at the kinetic molecular theory and how the relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature change within a gas sample. And then we're going to talk about Avogadro's law for gases and look at what an ideal gas is. So first, the atmosphere. So you notice the atmosphere is in layers. And here's a diagram showing you the different layers. Our focus is going to be on the troposphere and sneak a little into the stratosphere. So the troposphere is from the first 0 to 12 kilometers, and the stratosphere is from 12 to 50 kilometers. Now, what we worry mostly about in terms of our day to day is the weather. Now, most of the weather, or all of the weather rather, is located within those first 10 to 15 kilometers on the Earth's surface. And that's also where most of the atmosphere ma atmosphere's mass exists. So most of the gases, so the density, those gases are there closer to the Earth. <clears throat> In the troposphere, the gases mix continuously, which means the different types of gases that are inside the troposphere or its composition is relatively uniform around the whole world, no matter which continent the gases are above. Scientists also found that the ancient air that was trapped inside of glacial ice showed the same chemical makeup that our current atmosphere does, which means over a really long period of time, there's been very little change, except for some carbon dioxide concentrations. Inside our atmosphere, there's a variety of gases. The most prevalent or the most abundant gas is nitrogen. 78% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen. Oxygen comes in second, where 20.9% of our atmosphere is oxygen. Argon gases are present, carbon dioxide is next, and then other gases make up the last sliver. And those other gases include neon, ammonia, helium, methane, and krypton is our, comes in last. The properties of the atmosphere, so as we increase our altitude, how does that affect pressure and temperature? So the graph on the left there shows that at Mount Everest, where it's a very high altitude, there's a lower pressure than sea level, which is a very low altitude, zero, and a higher pressure. So the pressure at sea level is about 101.3 kilopascals. Kilopascals is just a unit of pressure that we use in science. Um, and so you'll notice that as altitude increases, pressure decreases. So as you go up on top of Mount Everest, there's a lower pressure than if you were here at the beach. Uh, on the right, we see temperature versus altitude. Now notice it kind of waves in and out and some layers of the atmosphere increases and other layers of the atmosphere decreases with altitude. Um, our focus again is on the troposphere and that's a typo down there, but this is the clearest graph I could find. Um, so in the troposphere, as altitude goes up, that temperature is decreasing. Notice it's getting more negative as it the, uh, it rises up. So as you go to Mount Everest, there's going to be lower temperatures at the top of Mount Everest than there is at the beach down here. So what is pressure that we keep talking about? Well, that refers to the force applied divided by the surface it's applied on. And those wordy math definitions really need a formula to help. So I included the formula here, pressure equals force divided by area. And I included some units that are used, so millimeters of mercury, um, sometimes inches of mercury, is used for barometric pressure, which is what meteorologists use to measure um, weather patterns. Pounds per square inch, you might recognize the abbreviation, PSI. Um, we use that when we inflate our car tires, our bicycle tires, and a variety of other things. And then the two science ones are kilopascals, or KPI, and atmospheres, ATM. But what, this, what does this have to do with anything? Well, we want to look at what pressure is. We want to compare a stiletto to an elephant. So you have a human being, very sm much smaller than an elephant. A human being wears a stiletto and exerts 3 million units of pressure on a very small point. Right? That surface area is very small. Then you take an elephant, which is very, very large in comparison, and on those four feet ex uh, exert only 125,000 units of pressure. So you have that human being which is a lot smaller than an elephant exerting a higher pressure wearing a stiletto than that elephant um, on its feet. So that just kind of 
helps you understand the difference between the pressure in relation to the um, area, that surface area. So we're gonna do a couple practice problems with that. And the first is looking at these four people to the right, A, B, C, and D, who exerts the least pressure? If you said person B, you were correct. Since they are laying down, they have the greatest surface area. So they're gonna exert the least amount of pressure on the ground. Let's try another. Looking at person X is wearing but just boots and person Y is wearing boots with snowshoes. What is the advantage of the snowshoes to walk across a snow-covered field? If you said that it increases your surface area, therefore decreasing your pressure, you were right. Since it increases that surface area, there's not as much pressure pushing down in the snow. And if you've ever trudged through a deep snow bank, you know how difficult it is to keep lugging your feet out from, those, um, out from the deep snow. So if you were wearing just boots, you have a smaller surface area, your weight pushes the pressure into the ground and your feet sink all the way down. Switch those boots out or add the snowshoes to your boots, now you have a greater surface area. You're not putting as much pressure on the snow and you don't sink as deep. You can walk right on top of the snow. Some of you might even know this from experience. So what does that have to do with chemistry? Well, chemistry is um, the study of, of matter and how it interacts. And in the atmosphere, we look at pressure and volume and temperature and how that interacts to form our weather patterns and um, just general climate. So we have to understand how gases behave in order to understand our atmosphere, which is composed of gases. So to do that, we have a kinetic molecular theory, and this is the movement of gas particles. So gas particles, there's a few postulates for this theory, and gas particles will, um, can be imagined as tiny little particles with insignificant or negligible mass because the distance between the particles is so large. Those particles are in constant random motion and they cause collisions. Those collisions are with each other, with other particles, and with the container. These collisions are considered to be elastic, which means that there's no change in the kinetic energy due to the collision. So you're not gonna increase or decrease the speed of the particles from a collision. And overall, at any given temperature, the average of the speed or the kinetic energy of all of those particles will remain constant. And that's where we have temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. It doesn't mean the individual particles don't change slightly and the makeup might be a little different, at different um, in different samples, but the average will be the same. Kind of like you can get an 84 in quarter three and quarter four, but have different grades to get that 84, um, to get that grade. And then we have that classic example, just to remind you of how gases are different from liquids and solids. Remember solids are still in motion, but they're vibrating. Liquids are in motion, but they're more fluid. They kind of flow and they move a little bit more freely than solids, but gases move erratically. And you can see that the picture of the gas inside this container is exactly, or very close, I should say, very close to this uh, stereotypical picture of kinetic molecular theory. So we have three laws that we're gonna talk about. And the first is Boyle's law, and it's gonna compare pressure and volume of a gas. These two variables are inversely proportional, which means they behave the opposite of another. So in this example to the right, as the volume gets larger, so the container is large here, the pressure decreases. And as the volume decreases, the pressure increases. Anytime that there's more collisions, whether it's because the particles are moving faster or there's less space, there's more collisions, there's an increase in pressure. There's, <clears throat> to the left, a picture of a bunch of real world examples for Boyle's Law, where pressure volume relationship really makes a difference. The next law is Charles's Law, which compares temperature and volume. These variables are directly proportional, which means they behave the same as each other. So at a lower temperature, there's a small volume. At a higher temperature, there's a large volume. And the reason for that is those particles are moving so fast that they force the container to, be, to expand. And when they slow down, allows that container to contract, compress. And again, there's some examples for Charles's law right there. Notice that lungs were in both. Think about the gases we breathe and ex exhale inside of our lungs, and notice that the temperature, pressure, and volume would all matter in our lungs. So it makes sense that it's an example for both. And the last law is Gay-Lussac's law, which compares pressure to temperature. Again, these are directly proportional and they behave the same as one another. 
So at low temperatures, there's low pressure. There's the particles are moving slower and there's fewer collisions. At higher temperatures, there's higher pressure. Notice the additional arrows on that side of the diagram. Those particles are moving faster at a higher temperature and colliding more often, making that pressure go up. And again, there's a few real world examples to the left here. A pressure cooker is like an Instapot. Some of you might have them at home. Ideal gases behave as the kinetic molecular theory predicts. So it's said that a gas sample that behaves under all conditions as, a, as the kinetic molecular theory predicts is considered an ideal gas. Most gases behave very closely to an ideal gas, but in some cases, real gases do not behave ideally, and that's when they're under extreme conditions, like at extremely high pressures or very low temperatures. And the, the diagram to the right shows a comparison of an ideal versus a real gas. So the ideal gases in these relationships have no volume, there's no attraction between the particles, and they follow all gas laws, or they follow the gas laws at all pressures and temperatures. But a real gas truly does have volume and it truly does have molecular attraction. So those particles are attracted to one another. But they only differ in their behavior at those low temperatures and high pressures. And last, we're gonna talk about Avogadro's law. Avogadro's law has to do with the number of molecules that exist. So remember Avogadro who introduced us to the mole? Well, that fun fact comes back again. Remember, a mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And if you have that many particles of any gas, it doesn't matter what gas you have, but if you have that many particles of any gas and you're at a standard temperature and pressure, the volume of that sample will be 22.4 liters, always. And this picture shows that the sample of helium, xenon, and methane all have a mole of gas at STP and it's 22.4 liters in volume. That STP stands for standard temperature and pressure which is zero degrees Celsius and about one atmosphere. So let's review. In the atmosphere, you have the troposphere, which is directly above the Earth's surface, going from about zero to 12 kilometers above the surface. The weather occurs within the first 10 to 15 kilometers above the Earth's surface, so that includes the troposphere and a little of the stratosphere. As, atmosphere, or as altitude increases, the atmospheric pressure will decrease. Within the troposphere, as altitude increases, the temperature will also decrease. For the kinetic molecular theory, we talked about how gas particles have negligible mass and are in constant random motion with elastic collisions. Boyle's law taught us that as pressure increases, volume decreases. Charles's law taught us that as temperature increases, volume increases. And Gay-Lussac's law taught us that as temperature increases, pressure increases. Um, Avogadro's law told us that all gas samples at standard temperature and pressure have a volume of 22.4 liters for every one mole. And gases will act like ideal gases except under extreme conditions. So I hope this video really helped you. Um, feel free to send me some questions through Google Classroom or email and I'd be happy to answer them. And I hope you all have a really fantastic week. Bye now.